Hi, my name is Phil. I like talking about politics. And so what's in the today's bag of Tory dysfunction? David Frost, the hapless oaf who negotiated our Brexit deals and has since grifted a living by saying how awful those deals are, is wanting to stand as a Conservative MP. He announced this quite a long time ago. Although he won't give up his cushy number in the House of Lords unless it's a safe seat. Understandably, given that there are well, only a few Tory seats that are safe in the country right now, other Conservatives are a little bit miffed. I can hardly call this Tory row of the week because there are so many going on. So let's just call this Tory row of today. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel. So I seem to be bouncing between Brexit and Tory self-flagellation each day at the moment. David Frost, a former whiskey salesman, on record as telling MPs before the Brexit referendum about the damage that would be caused to our trade by leaving the EU and especially the single market and customs union. A few years later, he pops up again as a born-again Brexiteer and Boris Johnson's choice to lead negotiations with the EU in order to agree terms on a withdrawal agreement. Those terms included a trade border in the Irish Sea, which Frost now rages against on a regular basis. In fact, I recall reading somewhere that those who know Frost regarded him as a nobody who liked being a somebody. So it should come as no surprise that he will twist and turn in order to remain relevant. And as being a bit malleable is an absolute requirement for a politician, you might imagine it makes a lot of sense for David Frost to want to become an MP. Though if he does, he'll have had a very strange route into politics by modern standards. Might be even unique. Like with most MPs, the way it works is the parliamentary career ladder is first you are elected to the House of Commons. Then you work your way up to becoming a cabinet minister. Then maybe into the House of Lords when you step down as an MP. That's the usual order. Frost was made a lord by Boris Johnson so that he could serve in his cabinet with zero parliamentary experience other than giving evidence to select committees. If he does now become an MP, he will have done it all backwards. But you can't be a lord and an MP at the same time, so Frost would have to give up his peerage before even presenting himself as a candidate for Westminster elections. He can't wait to see if he's going to win the election or not. That means giving up a nice role with a fancy title, and so he's not going to do it unless he's absolutely certain he will win. So he needs an ultra safe seat. After all, the idea of this uncharismatic oaf winning a tough marginal is laughable. He's as gormless as he looks and twice as tedious. So only a safe seat will do. The only problem is, right now, actually there's several problems, but one particular problem, there are about 360 Tory MPs and polls say that, you know, about 150 seats will be retained by the Tories after the election with the possibility that even 150 might look like a good result. You'd probably be hard pressed to describe the Tories as having much more than a few dozen genuinely safe seats right now. Some Conservative MPs are retiring, of course, but not enough for those who wish to stay to chicken run to their vacated seats. And the last thing they want is to compete with some gobshite whose only claim to fame is negotiating a trade deal that everyone agrees is terrible, including himself. And of course, a lot of Conservative MPs, even if there weren't already this pressure on safe seats, do not like David Frost. He's been grifting a living by attacking their party and government on a regular basis for two years now. He is therefore seen as one of the people feeding the biggest problem the party has, presenting a united front to the public. An article states that Tory MPs are upset that Frost has been selected as a potential candidate and yet isn't accepting his responsibilities to the party. Which is a very fair point. I've said enough times in the context of Labour candidates and politicians you know, when you ask to be elected under the banner of a political party, you accept that your statements and policies from that point on will not be entirely your own. You accept collective responsibility. If you want to do as you please and be free to say what you please, stand as an independent. I deplore those who wheedle their way into political parties, establish a support base and then drop all of their responsibilities. It's basically stealing you're stealing other people's credibility. And more than that, it means you're a net drag on your party's chances for election nationally, if not locally as well. And some MPs, are, Tory MPs, are reportedly calling for Sunak to block Frost's candidacy on the basis that he's working against party interests. Especially as he willingly allowed himself to become the front for the shadowy Conservative Britain alliance, which is that 
group that funded the huge MRP poll, which set the cat amongst the pigeons recently. Frost was also the one who personally applied a laughably incompetent analysis to the data in order to completely undermine the Conservative government and wrote an article about it in the only Tory client media outlet left, which still has some credibility amongst the general public, somehow. And I would agree that it is reasonable to object to the idea of making someone a candidate for your party and giving them a safe seat, especially when they ply their trade attacking that same party in public. But there's a little bit more to this as well, maybe. It's perfectly reasonable to object to someone occupying what was expected to be a relatively small number of seats who represents a destabilising factor on the party. I also think that due to the particular circumstances this year, many MPs fighting tough seats will resent Frost just waltzing in being given a safe seat. For what? Because, because he writes articles in the Telegraph go away. But I also think there is a conscious move to consider the balance of power between various factions after the election. Because right now you can think of the parliamentary party has been split into three broad groups and roughly equal numbers in each group. There's the One Nation Tories who are generally regarded as being centre-right. Although if you ask some others in the Tory party, they're raging Marxists, but they're centre-right. Then you've got the far-right, who as far as they're concerned are centre-right, who are roughly equal in number, but they're split into way more factions, so a lot more infighting there. Um, that being said, the far right have more of an impact on policy than the One Nation Tories because the One Nation Tories, though more united, have no backbone. And the far right, though more divided, have the advantage of being political terrorists who will hold the leadership hostage. So the leadership's frightened of them and the media will dedicate a lot of view time and column inches to their causes. So each of these groups represents about a third of the party each. Then you've got the other third who are basically like nondescript. They're just MPs. They, they, they kick up a force only when their seat on the gravy train is threatened. But this balance between the three groups could change after the election quite dramatically if they end up with fewer than 100 seats. So it is in the interests of those opposed to the far right to make sure there are as few of their major voices in Parliament as possible. So I would imagine there would be a strong desire to see Frost being blocked from safe seats at least on the basis that he will be trying to steer the party in what most Conservative MPs will see as the wrong direction when they're trying to rebuild. Because David Frost will absolutely be one of those Tories who, after their ship crashes on the rocks and starts taking in water, will argue that the problem is that they didn't hit the rocks hard enough. All very entertaining for us, not encouraging for the vaguely sane Conservatives who don't want to see their party go the way of UKIP. But on the bringing the party into disrepute charge alone, Sunak would be justified in blocking Frost's candidacy. The fact that he has not done so as yet, and may never do so, can probably be taken as a sign of weakness. And if Sunak is too weak to even make sure that the candidates for the election where his party are going to have to rebuild in opposition, if they're not going to be the best for the job, if he's not going to make sure he gets the best ones for the job, the ones who are most likely to unite, then he may be dooming them to years extra in the wilderness. Still, never mind, means more time to push for electoral reform. Although the downside is it also means more time before the Tories start taking Brexit seriously, which doesn't help anyone. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.